Hello, everyone, and welcome to Start on Campus, uh, the university classroom session. Um, my name is Jenny Danes, and I use she and her pronouns. Um, and I'm a member of the START team who is helping you prepare this summer for starting at the U of G in September. Um, so really excited to have you all here. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to pop them into the question and answer feature um, that is along the side of the screen for you folks. And we will either get to the, you by responding to you via chat or we will answer them live um, as well. Um, if you do have any questions after you leave this session, um, you're more than welcome to email start at uofwealth.ca um, and one of our team members will post that link in the chat for you there. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to start with a territory land acknowledgement. Um, so I'm currently at the University of Guelph and I realize many of us are coming from different um, locations, but I'd like to speak about the traditional territories at the University of Guelph, which is the land that connects us all together today. Uh, the University of Guelph resides on the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is recognized that the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples have long-standing and ongoing relationships with this land. This is a gathering place where we work and learn and is home to many past, present, and future um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. It is important to recognize uh, the lands of Indigenous peoples locally, across Turtle Island, and around the world. We acknowledge the land today because we all have a collective responsibility to the place and its people's histories, rights, and presence. Um, so today we're very excited to uh, welcome Heather Mitchell from the library and welcome some of our own uh, START team to talk to you folks about the university classroom. So today we're gonna go in depth about what the university classroom actually looks like, talking about the differences between seminars, labs, and lectures. We'll touch on professor expectations, both um, implicit and explicit, uh, studying, scheduling, and time management, and then also the academic supports and resources uh, that we have available here at the U of G for you folks um, to help uh, thrive academically. And then at the end, if you do have any questions, we'll do a question and answer as well. Um, but let's start by chatting about the university um, classroom. So you folks may already have been imagining what the university classroom looks like. Perhaps maybe you've seen um, it on TV or in movies, or you've even had an older sibling or family member uh, tell you what their university or post-secondary experience looked like. Um, at U of G, we're going to discuss the two options and two classroom types that we have, um, both in-person courses and classroom experiences versus distance education uh, classes. So for in-person cor uh, courses, these classes really vary in size um, depending on your program or what class you're taking. Uh, usually you have a professor up at the front. Um, they will have a PowerPoint, much like I'm using now. Some of them uh, choose not to have a PowerPoint. It really is up to the professor's discretion, however many do. Um, and you'll notice that especially with uh, the PowerPoint usage, um, some professors will post their slides for the students to review um, and some do not. So with uh, the university classroom, it really is up to the professor's discretion on how they want to operate that classroom and what information they choose uh, to give you. Um, there's a few tips that are really important when you are in the university classroom in person and listening to your professor. Um, if you notice on the slide that your professor has either on the slide or verbally repeated a key point multiple times, that usually means that it's a key theme or something for you folks to take note of and they're trying to reinforce that. Uh, you may also notice that on slides, some professors choose to bold um, key terms or underline uh, key terms, and those are also something that it's important to make note of because the professor is really wanting to draw your attention to that specific content. Um, there's also other um, tips for the university classroom. So students who sit in the front third of that university classroom tend to uh, retain information uh, better 
Um, they're also more visible to the lecturer, so it's a great way to kind of keep yourself on track. Like if you find you're a person who might get distracted by, you know, something that's on your computer while you're typing notes or your phone, um, it can be nice to sit towards the front so that you know that like you're visible to the lecturer and that kind of helps keep you accountable. It's also great in the university in-person class um, to sit next to someone else, maybe during your first class or sit close to someone who you know might also being uh, who is sitting alone. Um, I remember that's how I made uh, some friends and study buddies in my uh, first year courses by just sitting next to someone um, who didn't seem to be sitting with anyone else and recognizing that we were both in the same boat. We were both most likely uh, new students or new to the course and that, you know, we could share notes with each other um, and all that fun stuff as well. Um, it's good to have a buddy in the classroom to connect with in case you have to miss a lecture or in case you want to compare notes or form that study group, um, as it really is up to your professor's discretion um, if you miss a course, whether they'll share kind of their notes or slides with you as well. We also have an event during orientation week called the special lecture series. This is a great event for you to go to to actually experience a university lecture um, before you get into your classes. So much like the tips that we just talked about, uh, your, the professor during the event will lecture on a topic that they're very passionate about and they will be able uh, to then go through their lecture in PowerPoint and highlight some of that key tips and tricks like, oh, did you notice I've bolded this on my screen because that's an important concept. So it's a really great way for you folks to learn um, and get used to like a lecture before you actually have to do it. Um, for your courses as well. We also have distance education at the University of Guelph. So these courses, if you've selected them, are very, very clearly labeled distance education. They're um, asynchronous courses, so they're recorded lectures that you watch on your own time, um, or they could have a synchronous component, so it might be a live virtual class. Um, it's in really important when you're taking uh, these distance education classes to schedule your time as if you were in an in-person class. So make sure to schedule out your time to watch the lectures and your time to study just like any other course. And Heather is going to talk about uh, some time management after. Um, it's really important and a tip not to cram all of your virtual lectures into watching them the night before the exam because um, that can be quite overwhelming um, for any student. Um, and so it's really important to again schedule them and break them out um, by week by week schedule, just like you would for an in-person course. Um, and another great thing when you're doing distance education is to keep yourself accountable um, and change your space. Maybe if you know you're coming to campus in the morning for a class and you have a distance education course in the afternoon, um, you make a point of going to the library to watch your class instead of maybe more temptingly sitting at home in your bed and watching it um, where you're likely to fall asleep. So whether it's a virtual or in-person course, you will have some important resources for your courses. The first is called a course outline or sometimes a syllabus. These should all be posted for you in advance of your first class and they uh, contain an outline of all the important academic policies for the course such as you know what to do if you submit an assignment late, uh, what the plagiarism um, penalties are, how to contact the professor for accommodations. Um, and it'll also list out all of your assignments, due dates, and the percentage of your final grade that each assignment is worth. Um, it'll also have your instructor's important contact information and office hour information in the course outline as well. Um, it's important to remember that you are responsible for following the course outline um, and keeping track of all the assignment dates and deadlines. Uh, some professors will go over their expectations and assignments during the first class, um, but others may just mention it briefly and then expect you um, to keep track of when each assignment is due. That's why it's important to uh, keep looking at and referring to your course syllabus. Um, regularly to ensure that you're keeping on track of those dates and deadlines and even jotting it down in like an agenda or on like a Google Calendar, whatever works for you. And we also have CourseLink, which is the university's online learning platform. Uh, each professor uses CourseLink a little differently. 
um, on this platform. This is usually where your professor will post your syllabus. Um, some will post their slide decks or notes onto um, CourseLink as well. You may even be asked to submit an assignment through CourseLink uh, or even make posts on a discussion board um, with the rest of your peers. Your CourseLink page for your classes should be posted um, very uh, closely to when your courses actually start, um, if not before. So as you begin to prepare for your first classes, it's important to have reviewed your syllabus. Make note of all the important dates and deadlines of the course. You may want to write these down in a calendar, like I said, or in your phone or in a Google calendar, whatever works for you. And you also want to check out the different resources um, that your professors can provide to you for your courses. Uh, your professors and TAs also offer office hours, which is a dedicated hour of each week um, where your professor is specifically assigned um, to either be in person or virtually host um, a meeting for their students to come and ask questions to. Um, this is a great time to get one on one support from your professor. So if you have a question and don't feel comfortable asking it at the end of class in front of everyone, you can go to your professor's office hours and really get a question or ask them to, you know, recap a concept that maybe you want to understand a little bit more in depth. Um, it can be a little daunting going to see your professors at their office hour for the first time, um, but just know that your professors really are there for you. Um, I had a professor who once said, if no one comes to see them during their office hours, they're just sitting in their office alone. So many professors really do enjoy when you come to see them. Um, in the syllabus, it'll outline how your professors, not only their office hours, but how they want you to contact them. Um, many professors, you can book an appointment with them if their office hours don't work for you. Um, they can also outline if their office hours are virtual or in person as well. Um, they also might go over some resources on how to email them. So the response time of their emails, how quickly they'll respond to you. Um, always remember that when you're emailing a professor, um, please email them from your U of G email account and be professional in your language. Uh, this means that there's no slang or emojis in the email and always make sure that you want to sign off uh, with your first and last name uh, and your student number so that they can make sure they have all the information to help support you. So I'm going to send it over to Anna and she's going to talk about the different types of in-person courses. Hi everyone, my name is Anna. Uh, I'm on the start and uh, orientation team this summer and I just want to chat with you about lectures, seminars, and labs, which I have had many of since I'm going into my fifth and final year. Um, so when you did course selection, you probably noticed that some of your classes had different abbreviations next to them. So you might have seen LEC or like LEC, <laughs> um, SEM, and lab. So this would be uh, the different acronyms for lectures, seminars, and labs. And you might be wondering what is the difference between all of these. Um, so lectures, these are basically what you are probably thinking of when you think of a university classroom. This is when you are in the class and uh, your professor is speaking in the front of the class with a PowerPoint um, or just talking about the course content. Um, at the University of Guelph, you usually have three hours of lecture per course, um, and this might be divided into one, two, or three parts throughout the week. So you might have one course that has three time slots in your week, and they would all be 50 minute classes. You might have one where there's just two time slots and they're one and a half hour each, or you have one just one big three hour time slot for that course in the week. Seminars are different from lectures. Uh, in these classes, you will be in a smaller group of people, uh, but they're all from the same lecture or course as you. Um, in seminars, you will usually meet in a different location on campus, so you won't be meeting in the same place as where your lecture is taking place. Um, and these are designed to have more activities and discussion periods and have you engage with the content a little bit more um, and talk about it with your peers. And lastly, there are labs. 
So this is where you do a lot more of those hands hands on activities and experiments, um, but these experiments or activities will depend on what type of lab you have. So if you have a chemistry lab, then you'll probably be, you know, doing chemical experiments and mixing liquids together and things like that. But maybe you have a biology lab and depending on the bi type of biology course you're in, you might be doing experiments uh, with your peers. So maybe measuring their heart rate and things like that. Or you might be doing some experiments with plants if you're in a more plant based biology course. Um, it really depends on the course you're taking to know what kind of activities or experiments you'll have in your lab. And it's a really great to have all these different types of courses because, um, sorry, not courses, but classrooms or class types because it definitely makes things a little bit more interesting and you're not just always sitting in a room and being lectured at um, for some period of time. So that's all I have for the differences between these types of classes, and I will pass it on to Heather, who will talk about professor expectations. Thanks so much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Heather Mitchell. My pronouns are she and her, and I am a learning specialist in the library. Uh, what that means is that I typically meet with students, particularly first year students around learning and studying consultations, uh, the topics could be anything from professor expectations to time management and how to avoid procrastination. Uh, I do see lots of students first year all the way through PhD who are struggling with motivation. Um, if you're looking for me or uh, folks like me, we're on the first floor of the library and that whole first floor is really set up so that you can walk in and ask questions right at the front desk. And that is why the front desk is titled Ask Us. And you'll see a picture maybe later on uh, in the session. Um, so now that you've got a sense of, you know, what the classroom is like and the difference between seminars, labs and lectures, uh, I'm going to talk more specifically about uh, what professors expect from you. And there are two main types of expectations, the implicit expectations and the explicit, uh, explicit expectations. Implicit is basically anything that you're not told directly. It's things that your prof or maybe even your classmates expect of you, but nobody says. It's never clearly addressed. Uh, and that can be, uh, you know, classroom culture, uh, things you're already expected to know, how to read and write at university, and, and why and how you're being assessed in each class. Classroom culture and knowledge includes knowing when to ask questions, when not to ask questions. Uh, Jenny already mentioned this, how to address the instructor, uh, the instructor or, or somebody else in an email. Um, how to form groups uh, for projects. Sometimes you'll find that your prof gives you a group and that's your group for the class. Other times you're gonna be expected to make your own group uh, and that can be difficult, particularly if you've never had that experience before. Um, there's also an expectation that if you need support, you will seek it yourself. And that means making appointments uh, either in the library with learning services or writing services. It also means attending your prof's office hours uh, if you're looking for support from your prof. Um, there are more implicit expectations and you'll come across them as you go through university, but it's always good to take note. And if you can talk to your, your friends and classmates about them as you find them, you might find it a little bit easier to navigate. Um, also in terms of uh, implicit expectations are managing your own time. Uh, and I'm gonna go through that a little bit more later on about what that means exactly. Reading and writing at university uh, is not the same as reading for pleasure or creative writing, no matter how much you like what you're reading for university or for your courses. Um, you're expected to know how to read efficiently and that you should track your readings for fruitful uh, class discussions um, and also what it means to read and write critically. Um, typically, when somebody uses that type of language, they're thinking about, you know, what the author's purpose is of a particular journal article or chapter in your book, what the themes of the article are, um, maybe who funded the study. Maybe you'll find like a conflict of interest, um, which would be really, which would, which could be really interesting um, to your discussion. Also, uh, every course that you'll have really will have some type of assessment. 
Um, there are three main types of assessment, uh, the pretest, the formative assessment, and the summative assessment. So a pretest is like when you first get into a class or you first start a topic and a prof asks right away before you get into the content, like, you know, what's the answer to this question? And you might uh, you might do a Mentimeter or you might uh, just raise your hand if you know the answer. Um, but that's, that's something that happens before the prof gets into the material and that lets them know where the class stands. What are you already coming into the class with? What do you already know? The formative assessment, those are the things like the small tests or quizzes or maybe a small presentation partway through the semester. And that lets your prof know how you're doing in the class or how the class is doing overall and if you're able to um, cope with the content of the course and the speed with which the prof is going. Um, a summative assessment is almost a guarantee in your first year courses and those are big. They're usually worth a lot like a final exam, uh, maybe a midterm uh, or a large paper. And, and the purpose of the summative test is to prove to your prof that you have the knowledge that you're supposed to gain for that and therefore you deserve the credit and the prof can sign off and say yes, you've got the you got the grade you needed there and you've got the information you needed to say that you successfully completed that class. Um, these are all important because they all have a little bit of a different function and it might change the way you study um, if you understand the, the purpose of each of the types of tests. The one thing, um, it's not on this slide, the slide right here, but the one thing that I'd like you to consider, it's something called error analysis, and that's when you receive a formative test or quiz back or something summative, and you have the opportunity to review it. And this is really important. Lots of folks don't like to review things they didn't do well on, but you'll be a much more successful student if you say, OK, I'm going to take this opportunity to learn from those errors. And this is called error analysis, um, and it will greatly, greatly, greatly improve your uh, experience at university. Um, so moving on to explicit expectations. So Jenny touched on some of these already, um, but the, the two main ones are your course outline, and that's like how much each uh, assessment is worth, when things are due, um, all of those things, uh, and then uh, assignment rubrics. So the rubrics are um, when you're given an assignment, let's say you have a paper to write and it breaks down what you're getting graded in, how much each, each section is worth or, or something like that. Those are the tools that are going to help you figure out where you want to focus your time. And in the next section, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, how these things connect with your weekly schedule. So uh, if you're ever struggling with any of the things that I've talked about here, uh, that's a that's a good sort of flag for you to say, hey, maybe I'd like to talk to a learning specialist or maybe I'd like to talk to a learning peer helper. Those are upper year students who are who are there just to support you and answer your questions about things like that. Um, we have uh, we have um, workshops and events in the library. Uh, you can also look for us to have things like stress busting events during exam time. I know student experience also has things like that. So so keep an eye out around campus uh, for fun things like that. Um, we can go on to the scheduling um, studying and time management. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so. So. In this, we're going to talk really about your using your course outlines for planning and studying. Um, creating a study schedule, sticking to it, but not so strictly that there's not flexibility and some of the study techniques that are the most active and the most important when you're thinking about studying at university. So. Uh, in learning services, we often hear from students about managing their courses, um, especially if there's an online component. Sometimes that can be tricky if part of your courses are in person and part of your courses are online. How do you make it all work together? Uh, we get questions about improving grades uh, and also about how to address nervousness in presentations or just presentations in general. Uh, if you do have a presentation, you can always come and present to a learning specialist or a learning peer helper and get feedback on your presentation before you give it, which is which can be really nice in terms of um, making changes before before the big day. Um, we also hear from students not just about scheduling their time, but how to be more efficient with their time and how they can kind of reduce study time or make their study time more efficient. Um, so you think 
you you might think that making a schedule for your for your week is obvious. Um, you have one maybe right now you're in high school and you have a schedule and that's your that's that's the schedule that you're working on. Um, but a full course load at university is supposed to be the equivalent of a full time job. So if you have 15 or 20 hours of class a week in your schedule, that means that there's 20 to 25 hours of independent study um, for you to do with that other time. Um, and so your profs um, have built that into their accounting for what you're going to do with your time. So lectures maybe three hours um, and then you have all of that other time to um, to study, uh, meet with your groups, uh, other things like that. So you want to create a schedule um, that works for you. It has to be flexible. I'm really sorry. I, th I think that's thunder. <laughs> I hope you didn't hear that. Um, you want to create a schedule that works for you, flexible, um, and that you can edit it. Think about it like a working document. Uh, edit it as you realize that you need to make changes. It can be really tempting to create a strict schedule and then try to stick to it. And when it doesn't work, say, oh, that schedule didn't work for me. Right. That just means that you need to make some changes to the schedule. Don't throw it out because the schedule is going to be what keeps you on track for the whole semester. Um, so in terms of your weekly schedule, the library has a template online or if you go into the first floor of the library, uh, there's there's a there's a flat desk and we put tons of worksheets and stuff there and you can pick up as many weekly schedules as you want. I know students who try to kind of make a master schedule and they sort of use that all all semester. I know other students who take one of those every week and they do it every week as different assignments and things are due. They change it week by week. When you're making a schedule, you want to set out your classes first. You already know what that schedule is. Um, as Jenny mentioned earlier too, if you have an online class, um, e even if it's asynchronous, you're going to want to schedule that time in too and be pretty strict with that time. Then, and this I think is the surprising part for a lot of students, I'd like you to put your time in next. That's your social time, your meals, your sleeping time, uh, going to the gym, hanging out with friends, calls back home, whatever it is, put the time you need in for yourself after that. Then is your opportunity to put in your study time. And the reason that I'd like you to put in your you time first is that you don't want your study schedule to conflict with things that you'd rather be doing. Like if everybody on your floor goes out on Thursday night or hangs out on Thursday night, you don't want study time Thursday night and then you feel like either you have to make a choice to study or to go out. You can just change your schedule to make it fit you. So uh, every class has a has a course outline uh, and you want to use this to um, also form your semester calendar. Uh, so you want something that's four months. Again, the library has templates for you to use that you can either download or pick up, uh, pick up the paper copies. Um, if it's something that you can put on your wall, it might be a bit better. Uh, you'll find lots of four month calendars for students out there. So just pick one that you think works for you. Uh, and when you're looking at the assessments in your course outline for each class, um, it might be something that you end up wanting to color code. So each class has its own color. You're going to put all of your assessments down on that four month calendar and any assessment that requires work in advance like like a paper you want to make sure that you've put in your your first draft for that paper when you're going to finish your your um, research for that paper all of those things you're going to want to work backwards and make sure that you filled out your your semester calendar that way um I want to just continue a little bit on the uh, learning outcomes. So with the outcomes, uh, you're going to want to look at the concepts to see uh, what you'll know, what you need to know in that's in the course outline. Um, and you want to look at the verbs that will see like how you're going to be tested. How is the prof going to prove that you met these learning outcomes? Um, you might see words like describe. So you're going to have to describe what mitosis is or you're going to have to describe a particular feature of something or a concept. Um, so uh, you also might see something like develop strategies. So that means that uh, you're going to have to be able to apply something in that course. So you're going to want to go through very carefully each of those um, each of those learning 
outcomes and make sure that by the end of the course that you can do those. Uh, before you have any midterms or before you have any finals, you're going to go back to your course outline. You're going to look at those learning outcomes and say, what do I need to know for this assessment? Uh, and you're going to make sure like if it's if it has a list of all of these things that you need to know, you're going to make sure that that is on your study schedule that you're going to go through and be able to define those things or, or that you understand them well enough um, that you can recall them. So uh, going into like studying in university, uh, research tells us that reading and highlighting are not effective study techniques. Uh, and this is really important because you're going to get a lot of reading material uh, and there might be a temptation to sit with a highlighter and read the material and just highlight everything that you find interesting, everything that you think is important. Um, but that that is not an active study method. It's pretty passive and you won't retain the information well enough to do well on the final exam unless you have like just a beyond incredible memory if you're I don't know photographic memory or something um, for for most students they'll need active studying techniques um, and that means that they're doing something with the material so it's not rereading uh, just rereading and it is not um, copying notes uh, it is something that should be should be a little bit fun should be active um, and uh, all of that will help you retain um, that material so one of the probably one of the top um, ways to do active studying is quizzing um, and research tells us that you want to study in the way that you will be tested. So if you have a class with bell ringers, which is a type of study study um, type of testing technique, you want to study uh, bell ringers and you want to study in that format. If you have multiple choice quizzes, you're going to want to study multiple choice quizzes. Um, and if you have essays or long answers, that's what you're going to want to be doing with your study time. Ideally, you're going to create the quiz questions yourself because in the creation, you will actually be learning and retaining that material. Um, you can use online things like Quizlet. Um, some Quizlets are already formed. You might find yourself stretched for time and you'll be like, oh, I'm just going to look at somebody else's Quizlet and practice. That's perfectly fine too. You won't retain as much, um, but it might save you time uh, in other places. Uh, also quizzing with friends. So both of you um, or a group of you making a whole bunch of quiz questions and then quizzing each other, um, that can help too. So summarizing is when you, at the end of a class, ideally within 24 hours of finishing that class, you go back and you summarize the key content for that information. Um, and you ask yourself, like, what was the point of each slide or what was uh, the point of each key theme uh, that the prof went over? Um, that can help as well. Uh, cue cards are a great way to summarize material and test yourself. Um, you can do that uh, with, um, with like, actual cards, paper cards or cardboard cards, uh, or you can use an app. Uh, there are some apps out there that recognize when you get the answer right and it will ask you that question less often. So it will focus on the things that you're struggling with and that can make you a lot more efficient with your time. As nice as it is to get the answers right, if you're focusing on the 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 concepts that you know well, you're not spending as much time as you could with the concepts that you're struggling with. Um, so I'd recommend that if you're going to use an app, it's one that will uh, will track that for you. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of of whatever you use, cards or, or apps, uh, you want to make sure that you're making all the content personal. So any time that you can give an example from your own life, you are going to pair that information with a memory that you already have and it ends up making it easier to remember. So anytime that you can use your own words, an example from your own life uh, or create something, take some time to create something that is really creative, uh, that will help you remember as well. Uh, sometimes uh, when you have to compare a lot of information, you'll want to make a matrix chart uh, and this allows you to compare or contrast um, the titles of the rows uh, might be the concepts or theories that you know. The titles of the columns are things that you're going to need to know. You fill it out um, and then you can also make blank copies to test yourself. See if you can fill it in. Um, remember, if you're anytime you're doing something, you want to test yourself on the way you'll be tested. So if you think a matrix will be on your test, you're going to want to make sure that you're giving yourself some blank matrices to uh, to fill out. 
Um, the last point on this slide here um, is really, really important. It's about taking breaks. So one of the methods that we use in the library a lot for studying is the Pomodoro method. Um, that's 25 minutes of focus and five minutes uh, short break. Um, and we typically do four of those and then there's a long break at the end of that. You don't have to do four uh, and you'll actually find that if you use time between classes, like a 25 minute and five minute break between classes or even just 25 minutes to focus, um, you'll get through a lot of material um, and won't have to use all of that time that you've blocked off in your weekly schedule necessarily. So, um, and when we're talking about breaks, we're talking about something really different. So for those of you that are really intent on studying, a break from one course is not going to another course and starting that other course for five minutes or reviewing another course. That is not a break. We're talking about a cognitive break. That's when your mind is off uh, and you can relax for a little bit. Uh, it could be going to get something to eat. It could be going to chat with a friend. It could be going to uh, walk around the block. Any of those things are a cognitive break. Um, if you're having trouble with the study part, uh, you can find apps uh, or other things to do that will, will turn off your internet or will turn off certain sites um, if you find that you're scrolling or surfing the web and you're not really focused on your work. Um, but do, do take really good breaks for yourself. Uh, it goes back a little bit to that idea of, of setting your you time first, is that you want to make sure that you're getting the time that you need for yourself. Um, otherwise, it will be harder to focus or harder to get down to, to studying when it's time. Uh, if you if you think that um, that you'd enjoy being guided by an upper year student through your first semester, we do have a program in the library called the Academic Action Program. Uh, you would meet with an upper year student three times or more throughout the semester. Um, they would guide you through like asking questions about, you know, what's on your course outline, what your goals are for the semester, you know, how would you like to study or what things do you want to accomplish in the semester? Uh, they also have, along with that academic action program, is an accountability group. Uh, so you meet with a group of people uh, once or twice a week um, for this focused study time. So you'd have that 25 minutes to study plus five minute break, and there would be a staff or a learning peer helper there guiding you through that whole process. Um, if you if you are, you know what I'll do after this is um, maybe I'll put the link for the academic action program in the chat so you can um, look at that. Um, there's lots of support uh, in the library for all students. Um, if if any of this is of interest to you and you think you'd benefit from it, you know, come come and see us in the library. Make an appointment with a with a learning peer helper or go to a workshop. Um, kind of like what was mentioned before with you know instructors or professors just sitting during office hours waiting for somebody to come and visit. We, we're really here. We have lots of availability in our schedules. You can book us online. Um, and we're here really just to help you have like the best academic experience that you can have. And if you're looking for other resources, we're all really well versed in what resources are available on campus for you. Um, I will be around uh, at the end of this to answer any questions. Uh, and I'm going to pass this along to Patrick now around academic supports and resources. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so hello everybody. My name is Patrick. Uh, I use he him pronouns and I'm going into my fourth year of biomedical sciences here at the University of Guelph. Uh, I'm also an SLG leader at the McLaughlin Library um, and I have been one for around five semesters now. Uh, I do tend to work with a lot of students and as such I'm very excited to tell you about the resources that you have available to you in the library that can support your academic goals. And of course, I'll go into a little bit more detail about the SLG sessions uh, near the end of my talk in a few minutes. So if you're not sure what kind of materials uh, are available through the library, there is a list of some things that we offer that I'm going to go through now. Obviously, books and journal articles are things that most people expect, but we also have subscriptions to things like newspapers, magazine articles, uh, data, statistics, government documents, maps, information on companies, industries, um, and, and even streaming media such as movies uh, or TV shows. Uh, we also have a lot of library built guides on things related to the library, information, studying and writing, which are some of those worksheets um, that I believe Heather mentioned prior. 
Um, with these sorts of resources uh, might be expected. I'm also going to share about other resources that are, I, in my opinion, very important to uh, student success. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about is study spaces in the library. So we do have a huge amount of study spaces for students, depending on whether you like to study in isolation or whether you'd like to study with friends or classmates. Um, there are, of course, quiet spaces or spaces where you're allowed to talk to the people around you. Um, and we have a wide range of seating options depending on whether you'd like to be in a big comfy chair when you study or if you'd like a more traditional table and desk, right? Uh, and we also have a Starbucks in the library with um, lots of seating. People often like to study there in the, in the Starbucks, meet new people. Uh, the vibe of the Starbucks is great. I definitely recommend it. Um, however, if the Starbucks is full, uh, don't worry too much. You can also eat and drink almost anywhere in the library now. Um, so if you're worried about uh, rules around eating and drinking, don't worry. It's not just limited to the Starbucks anymore. Uh, personally, I would recommend that you check out uh, like each floor, spend some time on each floor, try to find the one that fits best to you. They all kind of have different vibes, um, so I would definitely recommend to find the one that fits you best. Personally, my favorite that I found over the years uh, is the basement of the library uh, because down there they have like cubicle style desks that kind of have divider walls in between you, uh, which really allow you to focus while getting your work done. Um, however, the first floor is also great for studying with friends because they do have big round tables and also couches as well, um, which is nice. You know, you don't always have to study alone. You don't always have to study with friends. It's good to mix it up from time to time, right? Yeah, uh, and then there's also support available through the library, uh, many different types of academic support, which I am going to go into detail uh, in right now. And in my opinion, this is our greatest feature. Uh, we offer support in areas such as research, uh, writing, studying, and both individual tips and uh, group study tips. Uh, and all of these supports, as well as any resources that I really have mentioned so far, are completely free. You don't have to pay out of pocket for any of these services that I'm about to mention or any of the services that I've mentioned previously, except for the Starbucks, of course. If we did give away free coffee, we wouldn't really be staying afloat. <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, so appointments have been exclusively online for the past couple of years, um, but we are quickly moving appointments for these resources in person. Um, and online as well to keep both options open. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, personally, the one that's my favorite, which I'm going to talk about soon is writing services. I can definitely say they're truly lifesavers. Um, but the one I want to start off with is research support. So they are available on a drop in basis or you can make an appointment to meet with someone. Uh, and we can basically help you find information on your assignments as well as understanding exactly what is a scholarly or peer reviewed information source in the first place. Um, we can also help you with citations, writing your bibliography and your reference list and all that good stuff. Uh, it's definitely a great uh, resource if you are doing a research project, a research paper or anything like that. Uh, then on to my favorite, which I previously mentioned, which is writing support. Um, writing support is probably one of the most popular services that we do offer in the library. Uh, these are one on one appointments with other students who have actually been trained specifically in how to help you with your writing. Uh, so they'll give you feedback on things like structure, flow, clarity uh, of your writing and all that stuff. And they'll also help you with strategies for working on outlines, writing a thesis statement, or they can even help you with things like all kinds of papers, such as narrative essays, topic essays, reports, literature reviews. Um, they are really well versed and they can help you with a wide uh, variety of things. Uh, there's also dedicated staff to support students who speak English as a second language. Um, so if you have any concerns about writing in English, we also have you covered in that department. Another support that I'd like to talk about is uh, studying help, and it's one that I really like to talk to new students about because it does cover a lot of things that people generally assume they already know how to do. Um, appointments work much the same as they do for writing services um, in which you meet with a student one on one who's been trained to support you in specifically for study skills. They're trained to support you in things like time management, presentation skills, um, taking notes in lectures, reading academic articles, and many more. Uh, this type of support is particularly useful to new university students, I do find, um, and the transition from high school to university is obviously a pretty massive shift, right? Um, expectations and responsibilities are really different from high school to university, and you definitely don't have to figure all of these things out on your own. Uh, rest assured, we are here to help. Uh, and I definitely would recommend checking out the study help resources um, if you do kind of want to brush up on your study skills and make sure you're really prepared for university academics. 
the last thing I would like to talk about is my personal favorite because I work for them, which is the supported learning groups or SLGs for short. So SLGs are course specific group study sessions. So instead of them being individual one on one, like all of the other resources I've mentioned, these are actually group study sessions. Um, so we offer SLG sessions for some first and second year courses. Um, it's mainly the courses which are have historically been challenging for students. Um, so it's really like the big courses that we offer SLG sessions for. Uh, the study groups themselves are led by upper year students who have previously taken these courses and done exceptionally well in them. Um, so you definitely know you're in good hands. Um, they all, the SLG leader will also sit in on, on your actual class so that they can stay up to date with everything that's happening in your class. Uh, the study sessions are scheduled in advance, but you don't have to sign up for them or anything like that. You can drop in to as many or as few as you really want to. Um, you don't have to go to all of them uh, or anything like that. Um, and it's a pretty amazing program as well. Um, it does give students the opportunity to not only learn from the upper year students who have excelled in the course, but it also allows you the opportunity to learn from people in your class as well. Uh, sometimes you do get the best study tips from your own peers and people in your class, asking them how they study, how they do well, how they take notes, all that good stuff. So it's really good to meet other people in your program as well. And of course, most importantly, make new friends. Um, I've definitely seen many new friendships formed at my SLG sessions, um, and it's definitely really nice to see that. Uh, if you would like information on how to attend these SLG sessions, you can visit our library website, or you can just wait until the first day of class. Um, if your class is supported by the SLG program, your SLG leader will make an appearance at your first lecture. Um, they'll come up in front and they'll explain how to attend SLG sessions, what times they're at and all that good stuff. Um, and we definitely hope to see you there. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to mention is if you want to learn about the library, our resources, our supports or anything in general, um, you can visit our website at lib.uaguelph.ca. Um, and on our website, we have a link to our most recent updates regarding COVID. And we also have a self-guided tour that you can take um, to learn more about library resources and support. All right, hello everyone. My name is Katherine Iverson. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the coordinator of transfer student programming. So I help Jenny with our transition and pre-arrival programs, but I'm also here to support transfer students um, who are coming from a different post-secondary institution, whether they attended a different university already or if they're transferring following the completion of a college program. I was hoping to talk to you about the academic year and review. I know you've been sitting very still for the last little while, so hopefully we'll keep this very efficient, but I'm very excited that you've stuck it out with us. So the academic year is divided into three semesters and they're four months in length. So you have the fall semester, the winter semester, and the summer semester. University does run programs during the summer as well, so that's there are students that are in program right now. The fall semester is from September until December, and then the winter semester is January till April and summer semester is May until August. Each semester has roughly the same structure, so you can anticipate what happens when um, in each semester. You'll have your midterms roughly between the middle of your second, the second month of the semester, and then you can as assume there's an exam period in the second week of the last month with about a week or two in between each semester as a break before the next semester queues up. One of the most important resources that I want to talk to you about and something that you should bookmark on whatever internet browser you use is the academic calendar. The academic calendar is like the law of the university. It holds all of the information that will oversee and govern your time here at Guelph, and it's also a great resource for understanding the prerequisite or mandatory courses that you'll take during your time in your program. In the academic calendar, you can also find the schedule of dates, which again is another important web page you should definitely highlight or save in your bookmarks page. The schedule of dates is released a year at a, uh, a year in advance, and it helps you anticipate when the exam periods are, any statutory holidays such as Thanksgiving Monday that will we won't have scheduled classes. It also includes information about when your tuition is due, when you can anticipate picking courses, and the time of convocation. I know you're only just coming into our first Guelph semester, but 
it's always exciting to think about the big long term goals. During in the academic calendar, you will also want to take a look through your department and program requirements. In the academic calendar, it will highlight any required courses you have to take, any parameters regarding taking courses in a different program, making sure you take a thesis course or um, a course that is in a specific program. Um, all of this information again is in the academic calendar. It looks very overwhelming when you first start clicking through it, but spending some time with the academic calendar before you arrive in September will also get you familiar with some of the language that we use within within the university. I also wanted to take this opportunity to recap some of the information that's been discussed in a previous start on campus email, one of those Monday emails that you receive each week. So Guelph uses some different language, and if you're talking to friends that go to a different institution, they might use different terms for the same thing, and it might lead to some con confusion. So the department, the program that you're in is also considered your department. So you might be taking history or animal biology or chemistry. That's your program. And that program is contextual, is situated within the college. So you have the College of Arts, College of Engineering, and those colleges, even though we use the word college, they're still situated within the University of Guelph as a whole. Other institutions sometimes refer to them as faculties. Um, so just in case you're talking to any friends and you're getting confused or alarmed when you see college on any of the language. I will encourage you again to review the academic calendar though, because it does help you understand more of this different language as you are anticipating coming to, if you're already in Guelph, then here, or when you're starting your program in a few weeks, which is exciting and a little bit terrifying, and that's okay. All of your feelings that you're kind of anticipating right now are completely valid. That kind of wraps up my section, so I'll pass it over to Jenny for closing remarks and an opportunity to ask any more questions that you may have. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so that is the end of our session. Thank you to all our presenters, to Heather, Anna, Patrick, and Catherine um, for sharing a lot of that information. Uh, I know for you folks watching, you might be like, wow, that is a lot of information, and it's only the middle of August. It's still my summer vacation. Um, that is totally fine. Um, these sessions are recorded and posted on startonline.ca um, and should be up within 48 hours um, of the session being finished. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat now. I know we've been answering a lot of questions um, as we go through. Uh, you'll also notice there are some links to the um, amazing uh, academic action program. There's a link to the uh, library website where you can view all the wonderful workshops um, and supports and guides that Heather and Patrick chatted about, um, as well as the link to the academic calendar, uh, which Catherine spoke about as well. And definitely go ahead and bookmark that. Uh, you will need it throughout your degree. I'm not seeing any questions coming in through the chat. Um, but if you do have a question, feel free to email us at start at uoguelph.ca. Be more than happy to answer it or help you get connected with the right resource. Um, but for now, um, we will let you folks all go. So thanks for coming today and we'll see you next Tuesday at two to talk about your final checklist and prepping for orientation week. Have a great uh, rest of your day, everyone. Bye.